This is called flow stone, and it's just created by an abundance of water. And this grows very fast, four inches per 100 years. This is like terrier hair out fast in a cave. And you can see the sparkling of the calcite right here that tells us all of this is indeed calcite. The final thing I'll show you in this room, if you look right here where my flashlight is pointing, you guys will all be able to see it as you walk by. There's a very funny looking stuff that we call the spaghetti patch. And this is called halictite or halictite. Formations that grow on the ceiling of a cave and in tight. We like to say they hold tight to the ceiling, like stalactites, halictites. Uh, formations that grow on the floor and in might, we like to say they might touch the ceiling someday. So we have stalagmites, halictites. But this is formed by water pressure. So instead of drips or drops or pools of water, these lines around the room that we can see are created by pools of water, standing water. But this is formed by water pressure, where pressure from behind the rock caused the calcite to sprout up through tiny pinholes and fissures. So it grew crazy, all kinds of different directions. We get our English word helix, or spiral, from the word helictite. So if you ever see a picture of DNA, that spiral, that mm -hmm. helix, actually comes from a cave word. Mm -hmm. So I know I've given you guys a lot of information, but what we're doing is we're reading a room in a cave. So if you ever see a movie, you look at a book, it's a lot more than stalactites and stalagmites. You guys can just look and think about gravity and water, and if the water is flowing or trickling or dripping, drops, drips, uh, pools of water creating these lines, it all starts to make sense. So before we move on, having said all that, I'll invite you guys to ask me some questions. Yeah. How many years is like uh, centuries or millennials? This cave is estimated to be a million and a half years old. That estimate was given in the 1960s. But as science evolves, so does our understanding of time. So for the last two years, I've been working at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, and I have drip loggers in the cave that I've been collecting samples and providing them uh, with water samples for two years now, and they're assessing climate change. Mm. And also, I've had a data logger for CO2 readings in the cave hidden all last year. And so using radiation, they've dated one of the formations at 430,000 years old. So all that to say that as science advances, so does our understanding. So we're still generally in the range of a million and a half, we believe. And that may change um, as we understand climate. California is believed to have gone through super droughts, like 700 to 1,400 years with hardly any water. So that can change things too. But that's the generally accepted age. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I see some of our visitors already moving up ahead of me. I promise not to lose anyone today. So I think I'm going to make my way up. Oh, wow. So this is our dome room. This room is about 80 feet high. And now if you guys get a look, if you could make some room so other people could also take a look at it. This room is called a breakdown room. And this room is created when water rose like a cylinder within the limestone. And when the water sat, it created several layers of a formation called calcite raft. And just like ice forms on top of water, the calcite began to form and float and touched each other and formed a sheet, just like ice. And when the water receded, the uh, formation called the calcite raft began to break down on top of itself, Jesse. ending up in the rubble people you can see in front of us. And then the flow stone came down and covered everything to the extent that we can hardly see the shape of the rock underneath the rubble. One thing I'd like to point out is that you can see the inside of the stalactite right here. And again, I just want to illustrate that all of this is crystal inside. Everything we are looking at 
The cave is mostly shaded with the tan brownish colors because of the okay, soil it's around Lake Shasta uh, having a lot of iron oxide. No, I don't in it. But uh, the calcite in its pure form is very white, very pure and translucent. This is our oldest column that we know about in the cave. This is estimated to be between 65 and 85,000 years old. This tunnel up here only goes around that corner about 20 feet and stops. There's nothing at all back there. There is a story that the Thompson brothers, if you've ever heard of Thompson's water seal, the three brothers that developed that product, with the fortune they made, they bought the cave to develop it for tours. They dug that tunnel okay. hoping to access the upper half of the cave, okay. but they thought they heard water. And so a good rule of thumb is if you think you hear water when you're digging in a cave, you stop. And so they abandoned their plans, and so that tunnel is kind of a mystery. It just leads to nowhere. That is an interesting question because last year we had so much rain that in the next room we'll go to, water was on the floor uh, for perhaps the first time since 1980s. And so um, I heard water moving and I thought, I was the only one in the cave at that time and I thought, I'm above that tunnel. And so I came down and went up into that tunnel and listened and behind a solid wall of flowstone, like the flowstone you can see here, mm -hmm. with no visible openings, I could clearly hear gurgling like a toilet tank in the mm -hmm. And it was fascinating, it turned out that urban legend was true. And so, uh, in fact, I got my boss and had him come over, um, because he's worked here 15 years and he had never heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, if you have a, a Facebook page, go to our Lake Shasta Cabin's Facebook page, and I posted a video, um, not of this tunnel. I did try to capture a sound recording, but there was so much water dripping everywhere mm -hmm. that I couldn't get the recording to separate it mm -hmm. from the other uh, water. Now, have these broken off naturally? I think these were broken off uh, intentionally because it looks like a very square. And what uh, about this? Uh, and I think if there was a force great enough to break some of these larger ones, it probably would have broken a lot of these as well. Would earthquakes cause some of them to break? I don't think so. Uh, you know, when you look at some of these longer ones, this is tens of thousands of years old, and it's still there. Um, I think that a lot of damage was done either out of um, vandalism or purposely done in the cave. Um, I feel very secure in the cave knowing how old the cave is. In our last room, I'll show you some stalactites that are probably tens or even hundreds of thousands of years old that are still up there. The only thing we know of that fell in the cave in modern times was a rock because it hit a formation that we used to show people. But I would still rather take my chances in the cave than outside where a landslide or a boulder might happen. <laughs> so the All right, guys, I want to take you to the upper part of the cave, but I will ask the translator if you could raise your hand. Do we have a translator with the group? Okay. It's very strenuous. We still have about 250 steps just to get up in the upper half of the cave. And so I'd like you to invite anyone that thinks that they might not be physically fit to do the upper half of the cave to simply take a right hand turn to go back to it. This is my favorite stalagmite in the cave. You can see how beautifully it glows. Um, where we see the formations that are more translucent than others, it's simply because the water flowed faster so it had less time to pick up the mineral content. So we know that the water in this room was flowing very fast. And if you look all around us, the helictite, the funny looking stuff that looks like worms, is all over this room. So we also know this room had a lot of water pressure. This is what we call deflection. See how this is kind of grooved? This is kind of twisted? 
that means that there was the presence of wind in this room at one time. Huh. And the wind blew long enough and strong enough that it just influenced the formations as it grew, almost splitting these in half and almost kind of putting a twist in this one. So um, I want to take us now through this area and then we'll enter the historical part of the cave. Every single thing I've shown you up to this point was discovered after 1959. From this point on, we see with our eyes what Morton and Richardson <laughs> saw in 1878. They never saw a single thing because this tunnel that we came up into the cave was constructed in 1959 to give access. So from this point, we're in history. So go ahead and follow me as we continue our journey. Um, discovered in November 3rd, but this says November 11th. That's because obviously they made more than one trip into the cave. This was their second time into the cave. Remember, we're now in history, so other people came into this part of the cave. Okay. All right, well, welcome to our cathedral room. This room is 125 feet tall, and some of you saw the bottom of the ladder right over here, and uh, uh, that's the top of it right here. That is our chimney room, that little hole that goes down there. Up here above me, this hole right here is the natural entrance to the cave. On November 3rd, 1878, Charles Morton and James Richardson entered the cave through this hall. They probably went this way and down behind this wall, but they explored the room until they found a little hole over there and then they descended down further into the cave. We came through a man-made tunnel to get into the room here. So this room um, was the first room that they saw. This is the last room that we'll see today. A couple things to point out to you in this room. I talked briefly about things falling in the cave. This is my favorite stalactite. I call it a torpedo because of its girth. It's not needle shaped. It's very blunt. But because of its girth, it probably weighs, without exaggerating, a good thousand, maybe 1,500 pounds. And again, at one cubic inch per 100 years, it's probably easily 50,000 years old. And I'm being very conservative in my estimate. So again, this has probably been, think about how many earthquakes have been in just the last 5,000 years, mm -hmm. and it's still up there, along with all of these others. And so I, I do feel safe in the cave. Uh, one time I was in the cave when a thunderstorm hit, and I could just hear the booming all around the mountain. In fact, you might have heard my radio. I can actually radio the boat from inside this room. We're closer to the surface than you might think. And it, it was amazing just hearing all the noise rocketing around in this room. But um, I'll show you one last formation uh, that's kind of unusual. This is called a splatter mite. And splatter mites only form in rooms like this where there's so much vertical area that the water drops get velocity. So you might remember that I mentioned that a Stalactite means drip and a stalagmite means drop. Splatter mites form when the water drops fall from such a great um, vertical area that they get velocity and they splat. So here's a baby splatter mite right here. And I've watched a water drop fall 120 feet and just splat right there and hit. And so um, let's see, a couple other things I can show you sometimes. You're talking about. Mm -hmm. I can hear that, and I'm not a loser. I'm turning <laughs> off my radio. We were trying to estimate how many people we would have today. <laughs> how many so, losers? Um, sometimes, using our imaginations, we can uh, see things in the formations. This is our drawbridge. This is our castle. And here's the king and the queen. The king has his scepter in his hand, and he's looking over his castle. 
So it's kind of fun just to look at things and use our imaginations. This is the room where the bats are sleeping. They are somewhere in here right now. I saw one earlier. We don't have a large population, maybe only 100. But they, they're in here. They're asleep. Um, but we love bats. Uh, bats are wonderful. Um, they uh, save the United States billions of dollars in pesticides, pesticides every year because of how many insects they can eat. A uh, female bat, when she's nursing her cup, can eat twice, or excuse me, half her body weight of mosquitoes in one night. Cave Dave weighs 200 pounds. That would be like me eating 100 pounds of mosquitoes. Mm. Doesn't that sound good? Mm. <laughs> yeah, not so much. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I can point out to you guys, if you guys stand near the rail, I've been pointing things out like this to you the whole time, 90 degrees. If you look right above you, holding the rail so you don't get busy, this is an illustration of how the formations are formed from flowing water. We see that over many, many thousands of years, the flowing water has just produced the formations growing four or five feet out in a limestone wall. So it kind of gives you a different view of the formations as they have grown. A lot of the white stuff you can see here is just simply oxidation because we are literally right at the natural entrance of the cave. For ages and ages where oxygen has been drawn into the cave. Oxygen is drawn into the cave. Sometimes people ask how big is the cave. It's hard to quantify, but there is a phenomenon called pressure differential. And if there is ways to measure the volume of air coming into a cave, that's one way that you can possibly measure a cave. But I'm going to take a break and let you guys ask me any questions before we leave. Can you pass through these sections? I see them all cut out with rakes and shovels and stuff like that. What do they do down there? And what do they do with that? So the room that's kind of there. That is a classroom, and um, we have what we call underground classrooms where we bring in school kids, and me and my staff will instruct them on the basics of a cave. And so um, I will hide little bits of calcite and fake dinosaur bones, and I have spoons, a bucket of spoons, and I put knee pads on them and those toy helmets, and they will dig, and I te teach them basics of a cave. And in a typical year, I will take more than 2,500 kids into that room. It's a long time. Mm -hmm. Are um, you guys are still exploring? Is there any areas that you're discovering of it? Yes and no. Uh, there is not a planned, active um, exploration. Of course, I explore whenever I can. A couple years ago, I was uh, exploring and um, went down a hole and on some flowstone I could see another hole that I'd never seen before. Oops, just blinding myself. Sorry. And um, it wasn't a really small hole. It was about the size of a hole where you would put your knees under a desk. Um, and as I tried to climb up to it, the flowstone, the stuff that flows over rocks like this right here, it was slippery and difficult to get up to the hole. But I realized if I turned on my back, I could reach the lip of the hole to pull myself up into it. And as I did, it was a space big enough, like a closet in a master bedroom where two or three people could actually stand up in it. And uh, there wasn't anything amazing in the hole. It was just like a big cylinder, like a tube. And I turned around, and guess what was on the floor behind me? A piece of duct tape. Oh, well, yeah. ah. I wasn't the first one. Yeah. Uh, but um, last year, I took a girl, a brilliant young scientist who had developed a cave mapper. Uh, she had hacked into a software called Ruby and used another technology, a software called LiDAR, that uses infrared mapping. And she built a little mapping tool. And we crawled in all kinds of holes in the cave. And this is the first iteration where the mapping tool 
created little points of light, little red dots, and then her second generation will connect the dots, and then her third generation will fill in the lines between the dots to actually show the structure of what she stuck down in the holes. And so she'll be back next year, um, and it's a tiny little device that she can mount on a stick and stick down in a hole that we can't crawl into. And our hope is that maybe sometime we'll put it down in the hole and the mapping will show us a cavity big enough that uh, perhaps if we purposely enlarged it with a tunnel, we'll find a room that we could actually open to. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right then. Well, what we're going to do Mom! Mama!